I'd like to move now to viewers' questions. Now, this first viewer's question is from Kelly from Utah, and she wants to know, what are some key plays you think China may make this year in regards to currency manipulation and or with the constant trade issues and military buildup in the South China Seas? What will China do toward advancing those conflict areas, you mean? Yes. You mean, what will the United States do to aggravate those conflict areas? Is that, is that what you really mean? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, it's just the viewer's question, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's a viewer question who apparently latches on to the propaganda narrative that China is stirring things up. I want to bring to the front how the formation of the question reveals the ignorance of the questioner in posing the question in placing most of the responsibility for conflict on China. So let me answer the question. I have a, a client named Jerry in Hong Kong. Jerry lives in an apartment building. <clears throat> and in the apartment building, it has a doorman out front. And the doorman said to Jerry one time about a year ago, hey, Jerry, I've got my son. He got himself a job. Can you believe it? He's paid $100 a day by a, a certain organization that I think is part of the U.S. government. He's paying 100, they're paying him $100 a day to hold a placard and yell things as part of a large group regarding the South Sea uh, Island dispute. So is China stirring things up, or is the United States stirring things up? If we had Chinese ships running through the Caribbean islands on a regular basis, would the United States say, why you have all this activity in our territorial zone? Of course we would. So when the United States does it in the South China Sea among their islands that are mixed in with J the Japanese territorial zones, the Chinese object, but we blame them when we have no real need for sending our ships through those channels. So once again, we're stirring things up. <clears throat> the United States in 1999 was part of a deal with Britain to give most favored nation status, status to China. Was that China stirring things up? Or was it the United States setting up shop for $23 billion worth of foreign direct investment with Canada, 23 billion US and Canada in just the first couple of years in China for a low cost manufacturing zone for export into the United States for benefit to the corporations, but no benefit whatsoever to displaced workers. Was that China stirring things up? Or was that the US and the British trying to exploit China? You can go after one story after the other, Elijah. Every single one of them has the United States and Britain on the wrong side of doing the right thing for American and Western workers. So. What's the prospect for the future? Well, I'll tell you where it's heading. Uh, Trump is going to want to bring back a lot of industry to the United States. He's starting with his target of NAFTA and the Mexicans, but there's going to be a good deal of industry. I've got a different client. I don't want to mention name or region because he's a prominent player in his own little region. But he said, Jim, uh, I told you about what happened in Tianjin with the explosion, a big fertilizer warehouse with 8,000 tons of fertilizer. So the effect was pretty much similar with a micronuclear device. He told me about that, but he said, Jim, I got to tell you something. I know about 20 different small factory owners, and they're all leaving China. They're all Westerners, several are Americans, and they're all leaving China because they see the writing on the wall with Trump. And Trump has talked about uh, an import tax. At the same time, he talks about a reindustrialization of the United States. So we already have an early view of exodus for businesses in China. I think it's going to continue. There are going to be some tax breaks for companies that bring back industry, let's just say to Detroit, to, to make cars and car components. I think it's going to happen. 
Uh, we might see a number of them being Chinese taking advantage of the free trade zones in Michigan and other places that already exist. They don't need to be set up. They already exist. Hundreds of foreign companies exist in the free trade zone in, in dozens of U.S. states. Okay, so we're going to be moving toward reindustrialization of the United States, probably before any official movement toward a gold dollar because of the trade deficit of $500 billion a year. And as we do that, we're going to create a lot of friction with the Mexicans, a lot of friction with the Chinese. And I don't think Trump really minds that the Chinese economy might slow way down in its growth because he's going to be working feverishly to build up the U.S. industry. So that's the prospect I see. And I, I don't see it moving toward war. Uh, that, that's basically your, your stupid fake news, CNN bullshit channels uh, trying to discredit anything that Trump does. Oh, Trump's going to cause a war with China. No, and, and we didn't cause a war in Europe called Ukraine under Obama, and we didn't cause a war in Syria under, under Obama's watch with a fake terrorist group called ISIS that we fund. Israel supports, Saudi supports, UAE supports. Oh, my goodness. The hypocrisy. I, I have two goals. I want to see McCain arrested for treason and CNN shut down for propaganda. Those are my two goals. All right. Now, I just found a really great viewer's question. I think um, now this viewer um, is Kenneth from the UK, and he wants to know, what conditions, if any, can put a stop to the illegal manipulation of gold and silver prices, artificially suppressing them so that they can, again, achieve their true value? Introduction from a, a foreign source of the gold trade note. Introduction in foreign banking systems of gold used as a banking reserve asset. Okay. If you get a gold trade note that will be used for trade and you see gold being used in the banks, you will then pretty much dismiss the dollar in its pervasive role as the global currency reserve. I know that it doesn't sound like, you know, it's going right after the COMEX. You're not going to shut down the COMEX from the front door. You're going to shut it down from the back door by making it irrelevant due to widespread coordinated foreign activity having to do with trade payments, which right now have a dollar monopoly. And with bank reserves, which right now have a U.S. Treasury monopoly, by making the two sides of the dollar's global reserve status moot, the currency reserve status, by making both moot, you're going to have an undermine to the, to the you're not going to knock down the COMEX by breaking its doors. You're going to... You're going to destroy the COMEX by removing its floors. Not the doors, but the floors. Okay, that's a very important point. So when the gold trade note comes into being, there's going to be a lot of demand for gold in order to secure, with equity placement, a deposit, if you will, a shipment of oil, a shipment of grain, a shipment of container vessels, and later, to guarantee, say, a multi-billion dollar uh, commercial deal, like for instance, what Euroraj put forth, it's a great example, the Indian nation contractors doing a health industry IT contract for Arab states like Saudi. It might be a five-year deal worth $2 billion. Okay, they seal the contract with a gold trade note. Okay, deals like that, you know, commercial deals that involve consulting involve placement of, of equipment like tech telecom, okay, deals. Okay, so when that happens, the gold demand is going to really shoot up. On the other side, when countries decide that, you know, we've got like Korea, 
We've got well over $100 billion in treasury bonds in our banking system, and we think, pardon me, we think it's all at risk because we've got six years of the Fed printing money to buy the U.S. government debt. You cannot monetize the debt of the U.S. government and redeem toxic bonds held by the big banks within the same country, the United States, when the whole world uses the same treasury bonds as the core asset foundation for their banking system. You can't bring Zimbabwe into the global banking system. You can't do that without big consequences. So the United States slows the opposition by attacking any nation that gets off that rail system called the dollar. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, so what's it gonna take? It's not gonna take lawsuits against the COMEX. It's not gonna take the 300 claimants to a single ounce of gold finally getting justice. No, they'll never get justice. They have a force majeure plan where all the contracts are nullified because of an extreme situation in the gold market, unforeseen and out of our control. Bullshit! Very much foreseen, very much in control, <clears throat> and planned for the, you know, the exit stage Z with the force majeure already in place. They got it. We're going to see a time... I don't know when. I, I, I try not to talk about when, Elijah, because it's very, very risky. You can be wrong a lot. Uh, there's going to come a time, I, I think it's not going to be several years. It could be a couple of years or less. Not going to be one or two months. It could be several months. So between several months and a few years, we're going to see the gold and silver price <clears throat> just not be posted. We won't know what it is. Because all these different deals where they're paying 80 to 100% premium for a $100 million gold delivery, <clears throat> those details are not well known. They're going to be about five or six, maybe seven different centers in the world. Hong Kong, Dubai, London, New York, Zurich, maybe St. Petersburg, Moscow, Shanghai, maybe Beijing. They're all going to have a different gold price. Because the East is going to have an honest system and the West is going to have a dishonest system. But there's going to be a darkness. There's going to be a period where we really don't know what the price is. We hear a bunch of stories and then maybe some innovative people come forth and say, look, we got a new service where we try to come together and, uh, and, and bring, bring a, a gold price to the table. It's going to be an average of these five or six different things. And... Uh, different sites and you know take it for what it's worth but we think it's valuable and it's going to have some variation okay that's how i think the comex gets knocked out um the floors get knocked out the doors do not get knocked down paul from england is wanting to know do you believe the cabal will create a major false flag event to divert attention away from the looming collapse in fiat currencies yeah i do um, not exactly sure how it's going to look. Um, I think they, they might do some things that would involve <clears throat> supposed Russian hacking into Wall Street banks and London banks. It will not be Russian hacking. It'll be Langley, Bush family, Mossad, Rothschild hacking. But since they control the press, the perpetrator can then blame Russia and not themselves. Since when does the owner of a press have a front page story <clears throat> accusing himself of a crime? This is something very difficult for most Americans to conceive. <clears throat> My father believes we have a free press. I try to convince him otherwise. I get nowhere. I, I dropped that argument that line of discussion, I dropped it years ago. Uh, I, I pointed out there are only five conglomerates that own the U.S. media, and that, that doesn't matter to him. He said, I saw it on TV, it must be true. 
I read in the paper, it must be true. They would never print lies. I said, why would they not print lies if they own the paper and they are guilty of the crime? So <clears throat> there will be something. It, it could be a, instead of hacking the big banks of New York and London, it could be just a tremendous effort to uh, wreck the usage of credit cards uh, across the Western world, across the Eastern world, too. Um, it, it could be like a hacking of even, say, the SWIFT banking system, although I don't think they would do that because they rely on that to move the dollar and to compete against the RMB, which now has an alternative. <clears throat> but they might... <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm, I'm having a hard time with my voice because I'm talking so much. <clears throat> uh, they might hack the Chinese competitor system uh, to SWIFT. It's called the CIPS. Um, it's either the Chinese interbank payment system or the cross-border interbank payment system. It's a competitor to SWIFT. There, there's so many different points of vulnerability. Uh, there might be a false flag event blamed on Russia, of course, because uh, Russia is now being blamed for dogs that chew up furniture and deadbeats who don't do their homework. The Russians are now the it's, it's becoming laughable. I hope they I hope they take it up a new level because it's it's going to go to absurd to self-incriminating soon. They, they might wreck the electricity grid in North America with the hacking. I mean, it's an antiquated system that's so vulnerable. So yeah, there there might be some some uh, false flag events, and um, but I think the bigger risk is is not a false flag; it's a direct flag, where they might do some bail-ins for a third of the, the the big banks and mid-sized banks, you know, the the larger banks in the United States and Canada. They might do a bail-in and just take thirty percent. Um, I don't think that would qualify as a false flag, but it would qualify as an event to really slap Americans and Canadians in the face for a wake-up. I've been saying for the longest time, until Americans lose their bank account and stock account and have trouble buying uh, well-supplied and, and moderately priced food, so banks and supermarkets for food, until that happens, I don't think they're going to wake up. I just can't see it happening. They're so distracted now by, you know, race riot stuff that it's all paid for by Soros NGO groups. And now Obama is a, a main NGO coordinator for fighting Trump and, and resisting, what he called it, there's a group that he, I don't know the exact name, but it's basically fighting for democracy. It's not, it's fighting for fascism against democracy. So I, everything's being turned on its ear. Okay, I hope that answers. I think this is going to be our last viewer's question, but moving to this viewer's question, um, they want to know, what do you think about the recent alliance between Russia and Turkey? Also, do you think another coup d'etat is possible in Turkey? Wow, the Turkish situation is extraordinarily complicated. They are bitter enemies with their own neighbor in Greece. They're a member of the NATO. They're a very important member of the NATO because of the closest country located to Russia. They lie on the Russian border. Uh, and any mission that is designed toward Moscow would originate from in Cyrillic base in Turkey. Turkey, I'm, I'm just going to rattle on all the complexity factors here. Um, Turkish Air Force Base for NATO is the number one stopping point uh, for the Afghan heroin. It, it might make some other stops in Eastern Europe, but it, it makes a very, very large volume in heroin shipments uh, in Turkey. And from there it goes to France, Italy, and Germany. The heroin! The heroin! The heroin! that the United States produces in Afghanistan for the European streets and the American streets. <clears throat> There's a large number of missing nuclear warheads at the Turkish Air Force Base. 
uh, of, of U.S. You know, label. Oh boy, the United States was caught red-handed trying to do a coup d'état uh, several months ago against Erdogan. Uh, there were many high-level NATO officials. Some of them were Turkish, but they're NATO officials who were involved in that. And I think the Russians might have disabled some of the devices that were intended to kill Erdogan and his helicopter getting out of town. Not just Erdogan, but his family. So the, the vile element was in the NATO high command. Turkey is also involved with its U.S. embassy as an ISIS field command headquarters. We're breaking international law using the Turkish embassy with the U.S. flag to promote terrorism, kill civilians, and coordinate things for ISIS. The United States, British, and Mossad from Israel are running ISIS. <clears throat> Turkey is also involved in some big disputes with the Kurds in northeast Iraq. The Turkish are very instrumental in raids in Syria under U.S. command. <clears throat> so, if you're wondering what's going to happen with the Turkish and Russian relationship, you have to bring in... in bring to the table all these extremely conflict, complex issues that relate to the conflict. Uh, I contend that the most complex country in the world right now is not Saudi Arabia, which was responsible for holding together the dollar petro, uh, the, the petrodollar complex and, and standard. I believe it is not Ukraine, which is where Europe and its two sides mix and fight uh, over Russian control of, say, energy source. Now, I believe the most complex nation in the world right now is Turkey, for the reasons I just stated, in a rather long three to five minute preamble to describe the complexity in detail. And I left out several different things. Uh, Turkey is where East meets West with Islam. There are a lot of you know, non-Arabs who have Islamic faith there. Uh, you have the United States harboring Gulen, who is the radical Islam uh, Grand Poobah. I don't even care what his real name, his title is. The Grand Poobah. He's in Pennsylvania, protected by Obama. And he's running various little terrorist strike groups in Turkey that are killing civilians. Why are we harboring in the Poconos of, of Pennsylvania someone who's responsible for civilian murder in Turkey? Because this is what we do. I don't know what's going to happen with Russia versus Turkey, but I do believe it's going to be rather constructive. Uh, there have been some projects that have been revived. Uh, after a couple of years of conflict following the Turkish military downing a, a Russian Su fighter jet, that was about a year ago, there was a lot of conflict between the two countries. That has all been kind of smoothed over. Of course, there have been you know, victims and families who have been you know, harmed, but I think there have been some rep restitution of those victims. But here's some of the projects. The Turkstream Gazprom gas pipeline is now back on schedule. Uh, it needs to, to complete certain elements, but when completed, it'll be a, a detour workaround that does not involve Ukraine and supplies southern Europe. That's back on track. There's a gigantic nuclear plant construction contract that the Russian, Razatom, was building. That's back on track. There's a series of gigantic natural gas storage centers in Turkey that Russia was to build. That's back on track. 
So I think you're going to see constructive engagement between Turkey and Russia. But the real prize, I think, that could come, I'm not going to make this a forecast because it's just too big. I think Russia eventually could, I'm just not going to make it a forecast, Russia could take control and pay rent for the Insulik NATO base in Turkey and bring it into commercial means for commercial purposes toward trade and not war because the United States is not about trade, it's about war. We don't use the Turkish Air Force base for trade, we use it for war. We have nuclear warheads there. We have hundreds of airplanes, and some of them disappeared right before the coup attempt that we organized, the United States and NATO High Command. Why did they remove them? So the jets wouldn't be commandeered and stolen by the Turkish other side, the nationalist side, that would resent the coup attempt. Imagine a Turkish Air Force base in New York involved with attempting to kill and overthrow the president of the United States. We don't think in terms like that, but the United States and the Americans think we have the right to have Air Force bases across the world and kill their presidents in the name of freedom. Wow. In the name of fascism. All right, let's move on. All right, well, I think we'll have to leave it with that, but Jim Willie, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where they can find you online? Oh, last thoughts. <clears throat> I'll tell you, my, my main concern right now is how compromised and diverted Trump might be so that he cannot carry out his agenda. And the other main concern I have is for the speed to which the non-dollar alternatives gain momentum and usage with volume. The internationalization of the Chinese RMB is, is moving along, but you, know, you could look at uh, reserves in banking systems and trade payments, and you're still way under 10% for the Chinese currency. It is not challenging the dollar yet. So... <clears throat> I think the gold trade note could really be important on that, and it's one of my main forecasts, it's one of my main points of focus, the gold trade note. Securing trade with payment backed by gold and not the Treasury bill. It's, it's a big, big focus, and I think it's tremendously important. Um, those are my focuses. Um, I'm also very curious about a, a number of different alternatives. I, I think this cashless society is going to go nowhere. I just noticed on a Costa Rican bank a billboard. It was not large, a small billboard on the side of the bank that said, uh, don't use cash, don't withdraw cash, use your debit card for more security. Well, if the debit cards are hacked, that's not secure. I think... Withdrawing cash from an ATM machine is, is very secure because this is not Manhattan where thieves wait at ATM machines to steal money from people who withdraw from ATM machines. I've never known a single American or, or Tico here, a Costa Rican native, who's had a, anything stolen while walking away from an ATM machine. I hear many, many stories about fraudulent debit cards. <clears throat> so I'm, I, I think the cashless society is going to go nowhere. It's, I think it's laughable. It's desperate. Uh, the negative interest rates is going to backfire in a big way in their faces. It's f kind of funny uh, offering negative interest rates to, to put your money in a bank in a secure place. Wow. <laughs> I think a shoebox and looking poor, not, wear, not driving a Mercedes, I think that's far more secure than using a bank account. All right. So those are some of my concerns, some of my little focus points. I hope people can go to my website, our website, www.goldenjackass.com. Um, we've now completed 155 months. So we're closing in on 13 completed years for the Hattrick Letter. It's been a labor of love. There are times where I feel exhausted. I know how to re-energize myself very well. 
I'm an expert at daytime naps. I'm an expert at, uh, you know, <clears throat> a, a three-mile bike ride to nowhere and back to go get an ice cream cone at a distant mall. Okay, that's how I unwind, decompress, and get ready for the next month or the next interview. But uh, goldenjackass.com is the home. It has a free web page called Main 5. Uh, that's where interviews like this, links for this, will, can be found. Public articles and their links can be found. It's for the, that's basically the promotion that I'm in charge of, along with the, the, the writing. I'm in charge of the as the editor role and the, and the promotion chart, uh, promotion role. But it's kind of fun. I enjoy it tremendously. Uh, there are times when I get tired of more fraud, more war. Oh, my gosh. Let's not have another war like with Iran. <clears throat> not going to happen because Russia and China backed them up. But the, the, the free website has the public articles. It has the public interviews. But it's all toward promoting the Hattrick letter with its 105, 155 uh, versions so far, editions so far. And the Hattrick letter has two portions. There are only a couple of exceptions. I think only two times they've had just a single report. But it's the Money War report. Global Money War Report, which is basically about the dollar and the defense of the dollar system, the dollar standard being defended, corrupt as it is, as war-ridden as it is, you know, blood on the dollar's hand. That, that's sad, but that's where we are right now, and a lot of details at a high level. But the second report is called the Golden Currency Report. It's a lot of details about, you know, gold demand and imports and movement of gold, uh, the petrodollar and, and its dismantling. And uh, I, I include also the Eurasian trade zone because that, that's an attack against the dollar system. But uh, those two reports are the monthly regimen and uh, got a lot of clients. And to be sure, some are, are very happy with it, but to be sure others are suffering from the economy and you know it, it's a collision of both uh, there's a lot of new orders there there's a number of cancels there are a lot of people coming to the the newsletter and people losing their job it's very sad what's happening with the u.s economy we actually talk about a five and a half percent unemployment rate when it's really 23 if you happen to count the people who don't have a job the official jobless rate is nothing more than an uh, interstate you know, a group of state unemployment insurance collection count. That's all it is. 5.5% is the number of people, is the percentage of people who collect unemployment compensation insurance. It's not the unemployed. Oh, my goodness. So, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we debunk a lot of the bullshit that's out there regarding the fascist state and its Reich economics. I mean, I maintain, Elijah, that the United States, starting in 2007, has seen a, between a minus 3 and a minus 5 percent economic growth, in other words, a five, 3 to 5 percent economic recession every single year. And I got the data to back it up, got the uh, shadow government statistics from John Williams to back it up. They're calling inflation growth by not properly reporting how high inflation is. That's what they're doing. That's their main trick. And uh, we really didn't even have an interest rate hike last December or December 2015. That was a fake height. The hike was really an adjustment to the reverse repo. I discussed these things. I debunk the lies and false stories 